also died for us. So that having taken upon himself the punishment that we deserve because of the wickedness that we do, because of the sin that we do, he is giving us the credit of his righteous life. And that is how Jesus shows his love for us. He laid aside his rights, he obeyed the Father perfectly, and having given up those rights, he conferred on us a benefit while taking away from us the worst thing that can happen to us, being eternally separated from God. This is the foundation of love. And when the Apostle Paul talks about love, this is what he's thinking about as the best example of it. Jesus Christ giving up his rights to lovingly obey the Father and to confer immeasurable benefits on people who didn't deserve it. And so as we read this list now, I hope we see the character of Christ. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's pray. Father, I know I've got a long ways to go in living out the love of Christ in the way that I'm submitted to you. And I know that I've got a long ways to go in living out the love that is described in these verses to the people that are around me. And I hope that all of us in this room would agree to that. And so I pray that as we look through more of this list this morning, that you would open our hearts to the truth that is here. And that as we look in the mirror of your word, we would see how it is that we fail to meet the image of Christ. And having seen those imperfections, I pray that you would keep us from being discouraged but rather help us to be thankful that you are showing these things to us and that through your Holy Spirit you have promised that we are able to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so I pray that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So love is patient and kind. We spent most of our time three weeks ago on those two. And patience is... If, if we think of the two as a pair, as two sides of the same coin, then patience is a passive expression of love. It is willing to suspend a reaction. It is willing to wait. It doesn't immediately respond with a negative reaction. It doesn't seek its own justice, but rather it waits. It's patient, and it is enduringly patient. The opposite, the other side of that coin is an active expression of love, and that is that love is kind. Love is looking for ways to express itself to others in little practical things. Sometimes it's easier to be kind in big stuff, a big momentous decision that we have to make to, to do the right thing toward a person to choose to act out, to live out kindness in the little details of our lives and the way that we interact with people and the atmosphere of our character is a different matter entirely. But love is kind. Love is looking for ways to express goodness to others actively. And in fact, it, it's, it's, it hopefully becomes a habit of life not a matter of, oh, I gotta, I gotta really buckle down and do this. I gotta work at this. But rather, it, it's a reflex of the soul. Love is patient and kind. The next five, love does not envy. It doesn't brag. It isn't puffed up. It doesn't behave indecently. These five are very good descriptions of the church of Corinth. We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians and we've been seeing lots of different problems with the church and lots of different issues 
um, these five can be drawn from those problems and from those issues. And I think Paul did that on purpose. And so as we look at these, um, I, I'm going to guess that we're going to hear echoes of things that we've studied already in the book of 1 Corinthians. The first thing that he says is that love does not envy it is not filled with jealousy. And if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, we'll see that this is something that was pretty typical in that church. For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? These people were filled with rivalry toward one another. They made church a matter of status and a matter of, of lifting themselves up and, and lowering other people in the eyes of others. And Paul challenges them in the beginning of the book to stop doing that because church is not a matter of status. It's not a matter of who's the most popular, of who has the most support. There should never be politics in church. It also says, he also says here, not only is, not, is it not envious, but it's not boastful. It doesn't brag. Um, and this is a specialized word that refers to someone who really likes to be good at debating. Uh, last week we had here a special speaker, um, and he is part of a ministry that presents apologetics. That is, it presents expert ways of defending the truth of God's word. If a person in that sort of a job were to be arrogant, were to be proud of their ability to win every argument, of using the information to beat other people's opinions down and make them agree. That's what this is a picture of. Now that's not at all what he was like. And he up front says, I don't do that. Instead, I take God's word and I just exhibit the implications of its truths. And that is the opposite. Um, and so what Frank did last week was an excellent example of how not to do this, but to still argue strongly for the truth of God's word. This is not what was going on in Corinth. Rather, the people in Corinth were, were very, very interested in winning the argument and having victory over their opponents. Now, that's the ground that we covered last week, well, three weeks ago, uh, four weeks ago now, I guess. So let's keep on going with the list. Um, we are told not only does it not envy or boast, but it is not arrogant. <coughs> Arrogance is a word um, in the Greek that's used only seven times in the New Testament, and six of them are in this book. So this, is, this, is, this word is, is dedicated to the theme of the problem in the church at Corinth. Love builds up the body of Christ, but arrogance blows it up. It would seem that the church at Corinth had especially no reason for arrogance. Their church was in trouble. Their church was tearing itself apart because of arrogance. Yet so often, it is the arrogant who are at least aware of their need for humility. Arrogance looks at oneself and is convinced, I am right. I know better. I am smarter. I have better information. I am more capable of expressing ideas, of doing a, per a specific task than anyone else, so I have to do it. And I have the right to criticize others because I have a better mind or I have a better ability. This is not how our hearts ought to lean. This is not how our souls ought to respond. Living a life of comparison, of comparing myself with others, of comparing yourself with others, is not profitable for you or for them. It tears down. It does not build up. Love is not arrogant. It is not puffed up. We are so told here that love does not insist on its own way. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It is not um, full of itself. It also says here that love does not behave indecently. And this is probably, again, being part of that list of, of expressions of what the church at Corinth was doing. It's probably at least alluding to the man who was living with his father's life, wife in all sexual impropriety. He was acting indecently. It could refer to being rude in general, but it probably doesn't. But that doesn't mean that we are licensed to be rude. 
especially around those people with whom we have the greatest connection. This could also be talking about proper behavior in church. In chapter 11, verses 2 through 16, there's a, a section on how to behave properly in church, also in 21 and 22. That's probably the direct context here. Love does not behave indecently. Love is in good order. Love restrains its desires and applies itself to make, a, make an orderly atmosphere in which other things, other things can occur. So it does, not ins- it does not behave indecently. It is not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Another way to say that is it doesn't seek its own advantage. Love doesn't look at the things that are going on around and say, how can I turn this to my benefit? <clears throat> this was certainly happening in the church at Corinth. Um, <coughs> back in chapter 10, uh, verse 24, Paul said, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And in verse 33, he says, just as I try to please everyone in everything, I do not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that the many may be saved. And so Paul here is saying, hey, I don't look out for myself. I discard my rights so that I can look out for the rights of others. This is the entire argument and point and lifestyle of Christian liberty, giving up anything which is right, anything that I can lawfully give up to confer a benefit on another. Self-gain, self-justification, a sense of one's own self-worth, these things are not of any matter. And yet we live in a culture that is obsessed with self-gain, that has an entire subculture of self-worth, that seeks to center my opinion of myself as the most important thing about me. When the most important thing about me and about you is your relationship with God and God's opinion of you. And it is when we are caring about these things that we are not seeking our own advantage, but we are actually able to do what Jesus did and lay aside our rights to confer benefits on others. Love does not seek its own advantage. Love is not obsessed with self-justification, and this is a difficult one for me. You ever been attacked and accused unjustly? Someone accuses you of something that you didn't do, didn't say, didn't mean, and they just, they just take it the worst possible way. They add, they subtract, they twist, so that you are in the absolute wrong light. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's happened to all of us, right? How quick does your defense mechanism deploy in those circumstances? I tell you what, mine's out there. I want to be justified. I want people to understand, no, that's not me. This is me. Brothers and sisters, if you are living out this list, the character of Christ, when people deploy unjust attacks against you, you don't need to deploy self-justification because you're already known as a person with this atmosphere of character. People already know that that's not you. You don't need to justify yourself if you're living out the character of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that in every instance, when you are accused unjustly, you should plead the fifth. You should not respond. You should just let it go. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I am suggesting that when things like that happen to you in your life, that you pause and wait and consider and pray and perhaps depending on the weight and type of situation, get advice before the I need to be justified mechanism comes out and begins to work. Because love does not seek its own advantage. This is damage control, what I'm describing now, right? But it's still seeking my advantage. And I don't always have to deploy that mechanism. I can do other things instead. So love does not seek its own 
advantage. It does not seek its own way. It is also not irritable or resentful. It is not cantankerous, easily irritated. And uh, uh, irritability, I think, traces back to pride and selfishness. Or at least I know that when I am irritable, that's what I trace it back to. When I want something, maybe it's just quiet. And I can't get it for some reason. I might be irritable. How's it going down there? Everyone okay? Okay. That's a wrong response. I think the kids are going to start using the word cantankerous in the home now. It's a great word, isn't it? Alethea likes it. Yeah. It's, it's traced back to a sense that I deserve something. But this whole list that we've been looking at is, is living out the character of Christ who took all of his rights and laid them aside to confer a benefit on us. Irritability is not love. It is self-love. An elevation of the significance of one's own concerns above the concerns of others, which is surely the opposite of Christ's example to which we are called. In Philippians 2, in this passage that you all probably know, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't grasp after the rights of Godhead, but took upon himself the form of a servant. He came to serve to give his life a ransom for many, right? And being, was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he made himself obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He gave up all of his rights. He laid them at the feet of the Father to confer a benefit on us. This is love. An irritable person can't be doing that. I think when Paul says this, love is not irritable or cantankerous, he's probably thinking specifically of how things were going in the church at Corinth. Because when people are at odds with one another in a community setting, whether it's in a church or a business, you all have experienced this probably in both spheres, in a class at school, in a sports team, when people are at odds with one another in a community setting, when these tensions arise, one may assume that the disputants engaged are being irritable in their responses. That's just the, the way it gets from my personal experience, and I think you all probably agree. So love is not irritable. It's not cantankerous. We also see that it, there that it is not resentful. A resentful person holds on to the remembrance of wrongs done against them or against people they care about. And that's pretty easy to do. Some of us, we can let go of wrongs done against us, but boy, if you pick on someone I love, I'm never going to let you off the hook for that. Your whole life, I'm going to remember that and hold it against you. Love does not behave like that. Love does not keep books on wrongs done to pay them back. And that's actually the word resentful there. That's a word that was used in Greek literature at that time for a person who was keeping books, who kept an account of debt. That's what the word actually was used for. God does not count our sins against us if we are his children, because those sins are already paid. And brothers and sisters, if God does not count your sins against you, what right have I to remember them, to keep a book on them? What right have you to say God forgave you, but I won't. An unforgiving heart, a heart that chooses to remain unforgiving, is a heart that maybe has not been forgiven. One of the consequences of accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is that you are obligated, required, commanded, even threatened. You must be a forgiving person every single time. And if you aren't, then be concerned. But God calls us in these passages to be forgiving, to not be resentful. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh man, that's me, am I saved? If you're sitting there thinking that, 
then your conscience is being pricked by the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you just to say, God, I guess I'm not doing this the way I should. Please help. I didn't say that to make you question your salvation. <laughs> I said that to help you see that God wants to work in you to fill your heart with the forgiveness that he has already given you. Love does not keep books. <laughs> Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what the church at Corinth was doing. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, Paul says, to have lawsuits at all with one another in the church is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not let someone steal your stuff than take them to court? That's how forgiving we're supposed to be. That's how not resentful we're supposed to be. Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, how often do we need to forgive? He said, forgive 70 times 7. Some of you like math. 70 times 7? 490, right? Here's the context of that passage. What if my brother sins against me? The disciples asked. Jesus, they, 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 want, they want Jesus to understand how, how, how holy they are, how much they're growing. And so they say to Jesus, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me, asks for forgiveness, and then does the exact same thing again? Should I do it seven times? And so what they're doing is they're saying, I'm going to even do this seven times. I will forgive someone who wrongs me in the same way seven times. I'm going to keep a list in my head. I'm going to keep books. Right? And then once they get to eight, I'm done forgiving them. Jesus is like, okay, okay, if you want to keep books, fine, but get yourself a really big one, 490. And you write it down every time until finally you get to 491 and then you can stop forgiving. Can anyone actually, well, maybe someone could do that. But that's not a way to live, lugging this big book around, keeping notes. That, that would be so soul-defeating. That would crush your soul. Some of you are thinking, ah, I could do that on my phone, no problem. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, don't keep books. Jesus, in his forgive 70 times 7, makes it clear that we can't keep a book on the wrongs that others do against us. It is very easy to be resentful. It's actually very easy to say, I am a forgiving person, while at the same time being resentful against others who have wronged you and just letting it pass because you've, re re you've relabeled it. I don't trust them. I won't do this with them anymore. Um, popular culture has got all kinds of ways to, to justify this. This person is toxic. You ever heard that? That's being resentful. That's keeping a book on the wrongs that they've done you and changing your behavior from benefiting them while laying aside your rights to closing them out because they are not nice to you. This is not a Christian response. This is not a Christ-like response. Brothers and sisters, to Jesus Christ, you have been and continue every day to be toxic because you sin. He died for you in an unimaginably, unimaginably horrible way. In that death, he paid your forever deserts in hell in that moment. And still, I sin. And still, you sin. I'm toxic. I'm toxic to Jesus. I'm toxic to God. But he hasn't said that of me. Instead, he disciplines me as a father who loves his son. Love is not resentful. It doesn't line up the evil. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us 
the message of this reconciliation. Are we people who follow in the steps of our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the way that we are openly loving others, full of forgiveness, not keeping a list? That's hard work. It's something that doesn't just happen. It needs to be maintained. It needs to be examined regularly. And only through God's love, only through the power of the Holy Spirit in us can this happen. (laughs) Paul goes on in his list by saying that Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. And so we've got a set of opposites here. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. And again, we might have some connection here to the lawsuits that were going on in the church at Corinth, but it can refer to any injustice. It doesn't take pleasure in the injustices that happen. And I don't think that anyone in here likes to perpetrate great acts of injustice. I'm not looking for ways to swindle y'all. And I don't think you're doing the same to me or to other people in your life. I don't think that's how we're built here. We don't do big stuff. But what about a clever advantage taken in business? Or a similar advantage to get... And to, to, to get what you want over your brothers and sisters in the home or over your classmates in school. Positioning yourself, manipulating others so that they take the risk and you get the reward and so on and so forth. What about in sports? Trying to influence the ref in your direction. It's tough in competitive situations, isn't it? Love does not rejoice in unjust situations. It does not delight in evil. And it makes me want to ask, what sorts of entertainment do we enjoy which might fit this description? What sorts of things do we read and watch? How do we fill our time? Are we filling our time with things that help us to rejoice in the truth, which is the next one? Love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. The Greek there is soon kairē aletheia, rejoices with the truth. <laughs> Rejoice together in the truth is, is the call there. Rejoice together as a church, as a family. Don't suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. Don't exchange the truth of God for a lie, Romans 1.25. Do not go against the truth, 2 Corinthians 3.13.8. And don't become upset when confronted with the truth, Galatians 4.16. God has made... God has told us so many places in his word that he loves transparency, that he loves honesty, openness, and the truth. Are we people who not only hold ourselves to the truth, are we people who rejoice in the truth? The next four items, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, is a relic of Hebrew poetry called a chiasmus. It's an X. And these four items take locations on the X. The first and fourth speak to present circumstances, and they're very similar to one another. You see that? Love bears all things, and love endures all things. I don't even know how to describe those two discreetly because they're so similar, they're so synonymous. Love bears all things. Love always protects. It always perseveres. It puts up with anything. 1 Corinthians 9.12 is an example of this. If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right 
but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. <clears throat> the New English Bible, another translation, translates this phrase, there is nothing love cannot face. Love is always willing to face up to a thing, no matter how hard and how, how full of betrayal it might be. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that the truth? The very first love, the very best love, the love which breaks into our lives, we love him because he first loved us and sent his son to die in our place. That very first love covered a multitude of sins. It covered all sin. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. It always trusts. We'll put trust at God's disposal rather than being reasonably suspicious. Now, I need to be clear about what this doesn't mean. When Paul says love believes all things, it doesn't mean that love is foolishly credulous. It doesn't mean that, that love is easily lied to. But love is, is willing to suspend disbelief, to suspend skepticism, to give a person again and again and again, because it's not keeping books, the benefit of the doubt, another chance, another try, another opportunity back into your life, another opportunity to, to have fellowship. Love never shuts someone out forever. To be sure, some people walk out forever. But love never shuts that door behind them. It leaves it open and says, come back because I love you in Christ. Love believes all things. And so in this, I think we need to be as wise as a serpent, clear eyes, informed by the wisdom of God's word, but as harmless as a dove. Always willing to give up our rights to confer a benefit. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Love always hopes. It is confident, not in people. I'm not confident in myself. It is confident that God will make all things well even when others fail us. It's confident that others around us, especially those who are always failing, are being brought along a path of sanctification, not by us, not by the pastor, not by the church, not by someone else, but by God. And so there is always reason for hope because I'm not in charge and I'm not at stake. God is in charge and his glory is at stake and he has said he will glorify himself. Love looks at even the, the people who fail and fail and fail and hurt us over and over again. And it says, I, I don't hope in them. I hope in God to do something in them that I know they can't do, that I can't 